While they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, giving thanks and praise, and he broke it and gave it to them and said, take it, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup of wine and given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, my blood which is being poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Failure at dinner time. American author and motivational speaker Zig Ziglar, who died in Plano, Texas in 2012, said, Failure is an event, not a person. And yesterday ended last night. If that's true, and I believe it is, then the disciples needed desperately to live on the other side of that Thursday night. The night before our Lord is crucified finds Jesus sharing a Passover meal with his disciples, intimately tucked away in a borrowed upper chamber. Jesus has requested to share this last meal with the men he has poured everything into over these few brief years of his extremely public, some might say controversial, ministry. That ministry, heard gladly by the common people and viewed as a threat needing to be eliminated by those who held tenaciously to the reins of power. The common theme, however, among this gathering that evening, despite all the time they've spent with Jesus, the miracles they have witnessed, the teachings they have absorbed, the unfortunate common theme of that Thursday night is disciple failure. On that Thursday, Jesus will be betrayed by Judas, denied by Peter, abandoned by all the other disciples. The theme of failed discipleship is the saturating scent that dominates the intimate mealtime fellowship on that particular night. Yet, Jesus establishes on that Thursday a new covenant with this frail and fractured few that have followed him faltering so much along the way that you have to pause to wonder what will be the condition of the ministry movement when Jesus is no longer physically present. He, while the meal is progressing, announces shockingly that one among them is going to betray him, to which John immediately catches Peter's eyes, just as the others are asking, could it possibly be one of them? And because Judas is softest of heart on that night and weakest of will that night, he leaves an open space in his life for Satan to enter. And he knows he has resolved to sell Jesus for what he will hope will gain him a meager 30 pieces of silver. Peter's look to John and cites John to lean over to Jesus since he is in closest position next to the master to ask who it might be. And Jesus says it's the one dipping his hand in the bowl. That results in Judas's abrupt departure to go meet with his co-conspirators to finalize the strategy to take Jesus before crowds really gather to start Passover celebration. Judas leaves. Just prior to Jesus taking bread, lifting it, giving thanks for it, giving it to his disciples, saying to them, take, eat, this is my body broken for you and likewise. He lifts the cup and says, take, drink, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. I want to stress again that this meal is populated that night by flawed, fractured, failing, faltering disciples. On that night, the room is populated with seasonal failures. One will deny, one will betray, and the other nine will abandon. And yet, at that dinner, Jesus establishes a new covenant with disciples he knows will fail, falter, and forsake him. 
This covenant is divinely connectional, it's irreversibly permanent, and it implies spiritual growth and fortified faith. Can I suggest to us this morning before we make our departure from this conference that there must be something Jesus knows about failure that doesn't prevent him from shaping purpose in these flawed men nonetheless. Can I say it one more time? There must be something Jesus knows about the gift failure gives to us that doesn't prevent him from shaping purpose in these flawed men nonetheless. He must know the significant contribution failure is going to make in his disciples' lives that will make them big enough to wear these kingdom-sized garments he gifts them with that night amidst the dinnertime gathering. Jesus must know that the failures they each will have to own after tonight will not cancel their resurgence of faith, their repentance of heart, their recommitment to the original invitation to follow Jesus to become fishers of men, to live with power, to bind and loose. Jesus knew that failure ultimately would not win. But in fact, failure would be the tool that God used to chisel iron solid convictions in the disciples regarding salvation, forgiveness, and the grace of God. Now maybe this is why Henry Ford suggests that failure is the only opportunity to begin again, but only this time more wisely. And I wonder if Jesus offers on that night an opportunity for the boys to learn just how gracious and forgiving he was on the night when they all messed up. The night they all failed, the night they all faltered, the night they all fell, and it all happened on that Thursday night. What do you do with your failures and the resulting disappointments associated with them? Do you believe, like Joe Brown, that failures are a part of life and that if you don't fail, you don't learn, and if you don't learn, you won't change? The question is, will failure contribute to the learning and the changing the disciples need to manage ministry in the future? Can we talk? Ministry for me this year has been significantly different than any other. Every other year, I have focused intentionally on what I can powerfully become in Jesus Christ. Concentrated time, surrendering to spiritual introspection and personal denial, the chiseling of increased disciplines. But this year has also been a painful inner lining surgery. And it has revealed the ways I've allowed failure to frustrate my faith journey. And I started thinking, I wonder who I pastor and who I live around and who among my colleagues who, like me, are perhaps staring at failures that make you want to quit. Failures that make your faith seem so small and your doubts seem so big. Who's let failure stop them from trying and going after the things God has said is possible? Failures that make you wonder whether fighting forward is even worth it and is there still enough left in the tank to fight with and with the way I failed God and failed myself and failed others, do I have the right to even pursue the promises that God has placed over my life? So I thought instead of me being the only one to confess, I would open it up for us to have a con congregational conversation. And I thought I'd ask you, what you do with your failures? And I'm making the assumption that not one of us in this room has lived this long without a string catalog of failures. Do, do, they, do they disappoint you until you can't imagine moving forward? Do they strengthen the grip of your regrets that are squeezing your life so hard that it's choking your air? Do they make you ashamed to announce that you anticipate anything by faith or believe you even have a right to ask? Do you wonder if your failures have messed up all your future opportunities? Has the door now been proverbially shut forever? Do you look at others and feel like Paul, like I've got to be the chief of sinners? 
and nobody around me carries the regrets that I do and finally do you wonder if there is a way up a way out a way through this hole that failure can drop you hopelessly into am I talking to anybody in here Jesus understood what later Seren Jericho God expressed when he says that the disciples would understand their lives best when they look backwards, but they'd still have to live lives going forward. Jesus needed to do something that particular night that would give them something to look backwards on to help them live forward, giving them boldness and conviction to preach the power of the resurrection, strength of will and determination of mind to establish the church and expand the kingdom. He wanted them to develop mental tenacity and toughness and internal resolve and intestinal fortitude to never be sabotaged by your own failures. Well, that Passover meal that Jesus shares that night with his disciples is in my estimation proof positive that failure is in fact an event but not a person. <laughs> failure is what you may have acted out but it doesn't have to be who you are. Failure may be what you have produced but it's not the definition of your life. You are not failure even if you are managing it. It's an event for some of us, a series of events, and each event eventually becomes yesterday if you let God shape you for tomorrow. Jesus, Jesus' message, I'm, I'm almost done. Jesus' message and movement and ministry amidst that dinner gathering that night teaches us a couple of things. One, this text teaches us that our failures are providentially covered. It's not by accident that Jesus chooses to share this meal to connect his life and death to the Jewish historical observance of Passover. Jesus is teaching and growing the disciples at the same time he's fulfilling prophecy and shaping the conversation of theology. He's given the disciples a chance to live forward and at the same time making an eternal statement that he is the final Passover lamb. There'll be no more need to sacrifice a lamb to symbol forgiveness of sin, reconnection to the covenant a people have with their God. He is it, fate to complete the permanent and eternal fulfillment of God's covenant with his creation so that forgiveness of your sins and faith in Jesus is all you need to be covered in righteousness and covered for eternity forever. You remember... The most significant event for the Jew was what God did that night before the 10th plague broke Pharaoh's strong resistance to release the enslaved Hebrews to finally let the Hebrews make their exodus from several centuries of slavery. The previous nine, water turned to blood, frogs biting, insects, livestock, disease, fiery, hell, locust, darkness, but it was that 10th plague that proved to Pharaoh the power of the Hebrews' God and the tenacity that our God has to deliver us Passover night. Hebrews had been instructed to put some blood from the Passover lamb on the doorpost of their homes because that night the death angel is going to be released to claim the lives of every firstborn son in every house except the houses where the death angel upon his arrival sees the blood. And will in obedience to God pass over the house covered in the blood. Stay with me. The second part of that arrangement was that each Hebrew family covered by the blood was to then eat the Passover lamb. Gird their loins, which in our language could be interpreted, put on your seatbelt. Get ready for what's about to come. Put on your ready-made shoes. Come on, I know it's early, but I'm starting to feel like I'm awake here. Put on your ready-made shoes and be ready to make your exodus from Egypt. So the Passover lamb was blood on the doorpost to save your life, but it was also food for the body to strengthen you for the journey. On the one hand, the Passover lamb was sacrificed for protection from death. 
On the other, it is food for the pilgrimage. And the point I want to make sermonically is this. That night, Jesus is among a group of collective failures. And what Jesus does is have with them the Passover meal to protect them from death. Their failures should have resulted in, and the meal was to strengthen them for the journey ahead of them because he knew he was going to be the lamb sacrifice for both their protection and for their privilege to keep on living beyond their failures. In other words, their failures would not kill them, wouldn't cancel their journey. They are protected regardless of what you think about them. They're protected regardless of what an adjudicating committee might come up with. He's protected by the blood and given the privilege of moving forward by the sharing of the Passover lamb. A relationship, a relationship with Jesus is protection from the death your failures intended. But I need to get close enough to somebody's ear today to whisper in your ear this reminder that Passover lamb, your relationship with Jesus is not just protection from death, but it's permission to get over yourself and keep living. to go ahead and enjoy the journey without the guilt, regret, shame, mental turmoil that your failures intended. You are in Christ protected, but you're also permitted to take your next step. Let me tell you what your failures can do. I'm, I'm moving close. Let me tell you what your failures can do. Your failures can frustrate events. They can shape events. They can cancel events. But let me tell you what your failures cannot do. They cannot erode or erase your covering. They can't stop your journey. They can't stop God from forgiving you or giving you another chance. They can't frustrate grace or minimize mercy. So you let the blood protect you and you let your digesting of his word and will and person and personality progress you because your failures are already covered. Now, not only are your failures covered, but your failures are also collateralized. Jesus pledged his life to cover a payment for you. Take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. He covered the debt. Our failures have piled up. And since we couldn't pay it, justice made the call for collection of the debt in total. And Jesus collateralized our debt with his own sacrifice. So his body, his blood lifted the debt up off of your life. And this is what we call in theological jargon, substitutionary atonement. You remember what the prophet said, but in fact, he has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. We ignorantly assumed that he was stricken, struck down by God and degraded and humiliated. But he was wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our wickedness, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing. The punishment required for our well-being was put on him and by his stripes we have been healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, turn each one to his own way but the Lord has caused the wickedness of all of our sin our injustice our wrongdoing to fall on him Paul put it another way Paul said he made Christ who knew no sin to judicially be sin on our behalf so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. That is, we would be made acceptable to him and placed in right relationship with him by his gracious, loving kindness. Can I pause parenthetically to suggest to us what preacher in this gathering today deserves to have had the length of tenure of your exercise in ministry? If we were to compare the length of your tenure to the failures that string along 
wrong behind you. All of us would have to tip our hat, throw up our Baptist index finger, make our way out of the back door, turn in our resignation, promise to never preach again. But you deserve to be in your pulpit this Sunday. And I'm going to tell you why. Not because you earned it, but because it's been collateralized. Jesus was substituted for us by who by God now I don't describe to the thinking of theologians like Origen and others who believe the price for our failures was paid to Satan I don't anchor in that kind of theological reflection I don't think God took the money bag of our redemption Okay, I'm sorry, modern culture. I don't think he cash at Satan the price of our redemption. The debt wasn't held by Satan. Though he influences us to live in ways that creates the debt, the debt was owed to God. And God substituted Jesus for us to make the payment to himself for the debt humanity owed to him. You talk about living with gratitude and thanksgiving and appreciation. I want to register today, excuse me, but I'm starting to feel old churchy here. I want to thank the Lord for waking me up this morning and bidding my golden moments to roll on a little while longer. I want to thank him for the breath in my body. You talk about gratitude and the will to testify. Here's my testimony. I'm grateful that I owed God a debt and then God paid my debt with his redeeming blood to him himself how you gonna take money out your own account give it to the person who owes you money and then make the deposit on their behalf and cancel their debt out the Passover meal Jesus shares with the disciples listen is both an intimate fellowship but the point I want to make for our discussion today is it is also a business transaction the Greek word that helps us to understand the emotion that comes with failure is that feminine noun that means sin, which is missing the mark, you already know. But its root word is the word meros, M-A-R-O-S, which means a share or a part. So one of the ways we look at our moral failure, sin, is the feeling of having forfeited our share having forfeited our part, missed the mark, but I feel like I forfeited my share. When I fail spiritually, I feel like I messed up my share of the eternal inheritance, ministry involvement, and the housing of my ministry gift or pastoral assignment. I forfeited what God had for me because of my self-originating failure. The point of that meal that night and the new covenant established that night is I may have missed the mark, but in Jesus, I haven't lost my share. I wait for everybody. Because Jesus guarantees my share in the Last Supper and he collateralizes it with his body and his blood. I'm loved not up until my failure. I am loved through it and past it as well. And every day the Lord leads me so that I can protect my share in the eternal inheritance I have in him. Now this is so theologically central. You have protection from the penalty of your failure. A chance to outlive your failure and a chance to move forward from your failure because Jesus collateralized your failures in his death and don't you keep paying for what he already paid for I'm done finally I want you to observe with me that your failures don't weaken covenants your failures are covered they're collateralized and finally they don't weaken covenants 
Jesus says his body and blood are the Passover lamb that permits the disciples to live past their failures. He suggests that this vesting of spiritual significance in the bread and cup are the creation of a new covenant. His life for their salvation, substituting his blamelessness for their guilt, his glory, their shame, his surrender for their freedom, his death for their eternal life. Notice that the covenant stretches from their failures to his promise that they will outlive it so powerfully that he says he'll reenact this night with them in the kingdom in the future. Matthew chapter 26 verse 29 has Jesus saying, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine until I drink it again with you in my father's kingdom. Y'all starting to act like my membership don't know when to shout. Because you are not only living with a chance to outlive your failures, you're living on the strength of a covenant. That Greek word for covenant means you're living with his will and testament that contains how he wants his affairs to be handled with respect to you. And the point I want to make before I take my seat is this. Your failures cannot cancel how he has determined the handling of his affairs concerning you. And he already factored in your trip up and mistakes when he was writing out your place in his will. Have I got a witness here? Satan's snare can't trump God's will. God's agreement is set when it comes to you. Now that ought to make you want to live up to it. One of the reasons I want to offer God holiness with a degree of pursued excellence is because I already know I'm written in the will. And I want to live up to it when it's time for me to gather my inheritance. Do I have any company in this building? He already has a date in his mind when you're going to be drinking from the cup with him in the kingdom of God. His future plans have already included you. So get up from your failures and chase the reality the covenant has protected for you. People around you may not let you forget what you've done, but the God of your salvation says, I've already factored it in so that when you get to the kingdom, you can still drink from the cup. So here, here's, 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 here's my pastoral moment for you. Preacher, go and be not what you've done, but go be what you've outlived. Stop being who you were in the past. And why don't you stretch and become who you are in the future? And if I'm so close to Jesus in the future that he's going to let me drink from the same cup, then let me be this close to him in the present and live in the strength of that same covenant love and grace determined that the next time Jesus lifts this cup, I'm already there. And I'm going to let that same love and grace cover my failures so I can start making my way towards it. Failure is an event. It is not a person. Grab somebody by the hand. Look at them in the eye. Tell them before you go home, let me preach to you. Failure is an event. It's not a person. And yesterday ended last night. So weeping endures for a night. But joy comes in the morning. And I know we got to come to the table. But why don't you help me to help somebody? Put your arm around them and pull them close. And tell them I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. You're finding me. That all in all. Y'all supposed to be talking to somebody. Turn the person on the other side. Take them by the hand. I want you to preach to them and tell them for nothing could have I whereby thy grace to claim. I wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Sin left a crimson stain. Somebody help me holler. But he washed it. Yes, he did. Tell him he washed it. White as snow. Say 